Uh, Father in heaven, well, great is your faithfulness. And that's really been the resounding theme that we've been exploring over the last um, eight or so months. And Lord, I just pray that as we open up the word and we look at the story of Ezra, Lord, may we learn something new. May our hearts be stirred, Lord. May you convict us of what you would have us to do in our lives. And uh, yeah, Lord, may we have a tailor-made message for each and every person here today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're up to the very last message in our By Faith series. These are the 12 messages that we've been through. And so this, the, in the week that we've just had, I've been brainstorming and planning and researching for a, a brand new series to launch into when we finish this one. And so there's a couple of verses that I'm going to share with you what, the, what this new series is going to be, and then we'll get into Ezra. There's a couple of verses that have sort of provided a bit of a framework for um, the title that, that I've got. And the first one is this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And the Apostle John writes this and says, That which was from the beginning, which, are, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and we, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to actually meet Jesus face to face? What, what it would have been like for the, the men and the women when Jesus walked this earth? What it would have been like for them to see Jesus, to touch Jesus, to hear Jesus? It would have been an incredible experience. And in 1 John, he's, um, John is describing how he had that experience. And he testifies to being a witness of Jesus. In Luke chapter 24 is another, this is at the end of the Gospel of Luke. And this is the Great Commission being told through the, the, um, through the Luke's version of the Great Commission. And he says this, and he told them, this is what is written. And this is, so Jesus has been risen from the dead. He's meeting with his disciples. Um, and he's giving them basically a Bible study on all the prophecies they had not understood in the Old Testament about all that he would do. This is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then he says, Jesus says, You are witnesses of those of these things. You are witnesses of these things. So what we're going to be looking at for our next series, um, the series is called The Witnesses. Okay? We heard we saw and we touched. And we're, so we're going to be going on a journey through the story of Jesus. We're going to take it chronologically um, and we're going to explore the, the various men and women and groups and children that encountered Jesus. And we're going to unpack what that experience was like and what are the lessons that we learn from that. So this is our series, the, the ones we're going to go through. It's quite an extensive one. And there's probably another 20 I could have put in there, which I had to uh, exclude. So I've picked what I think are the highlights. And a few of these I'm already really excited to preach. So we're going to start with the parents. What was it like for Mary and Joseph to be mother and father of Jesus? And we're going to take it right through to when we have the criminals, the thief on the cross, Barabbas, and what was their experience like with encountering Jesus? So there's a little um, teaser for where we're going to be going with our preaching here in Forest's Beach. So as I said, this is the last um, sermon of the By Faith series. So I thought we should begin with a bit of a review of where it is that we've gone. Um, so you would remember back in my first sermon when I came here to Forrester's Beach was on Abraham. And Abraham was the person who, for him, faith looked like waiting. Okay, 25 years is how long he waited to have that child that God had promised him through which a nation was to come and which the, the world was to be blessed. And so the lesson for us was that often living a life by faith means to wait. Then we looked at the story of Jacob, and the story of Jacob was very much a love story, the part that we looked at, his love story with Rachel. And you would remember how he, he labored for seven years in order to win um, Rachel as his wife. And at the end of that, he says, it all seemed like just a few days. And we looked at, and we, we linked that to the story of Jesus and him on the cross in Hebrews 12, where it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. And we examined how for Jesus, 
the worst death possibly that you could ever imagine was for him like just a few days compared to the surpassing worth of spending eternity with us. Sermon 3. Joseph, the title was, Do all that you do with all of your heart for God. And we began that sermon by looking at a verse in Colossians where um, Paul is writing to slaves and he's saying, when you're a slave, tri- um, serve your master as if you're serving Jesus. And we said, what would that look like in real life? And the, story, uh, and the story of Joseph is the answer to that question. And whether he was a slave, whether he was a prisoner, whether he was in Pharaoh's palace, he did all that he did with all of his heart for God and the world was changed as a result of it. Sermon 4, Mountain of Grace. And we talked about how sometimes in the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament can seem a little bit of a scary God. And especially in, on Mount Sinai is where we see this, that the mountain is ablaze with fire, it's, there's rumbling, that God is speaking the Ten Commandments. But we saw that while um, in the scene that immediately followed, Israel was worshipping this golden calf. And at the same time they were doing that, God was giving Moses the instructions for the sanctuary which was his plan of salvation. So God's first instinct when we, when we do something wrong is not condemnation. His first reaction is to plan about our salvation. Joshua's secret. Joshua is a person that of all the characters in the, in the Old Testament just did some amazing heroic things by faith. You would remember when he, he prayed and he, he asked God to stop the sun in the sky. What an incredible thing. And God did it and the sun stopped in the sky. And the secret to his success was, was found in, in Joshua 1 verse 8, where God, where God said to Joshua, study the word of God, speak about the word of God, and apply the word of God, and you'll be prosperous. And so our devotion to scripture is what brings us success in the Christian experience. Samson, strength in weakness. Samson is someone who was incredibly strong, but his greatest moment was when he was at his absolute weakness, where his eyes are plucked out, he's been dragged along like a slave, and at that point was when he put his trust in God, and that is the secret to living the life of faith. David, from shepherd to king, maybe we'll skip through a couple of these. Solomon, the wisest fool. Elisha, open my eyes, um, and the day of good news. Isaiah, faith in crisis. I particularly like this one, the picture of Hezekiah. The Assyrians are at his doorstep, and the nation is about to be destroyed by the Assyrians and he goes and he gets that letter and he gets on his knees and he spreads it before God and he pleads for his help. Last week we looked at Daniel and this week our final one is Ezra. And I've called, I've called the topic today putting our talk into action because it's one thing to talk about living a life by faith but it's an entirely different thing to actually take the next step and that is to live it out in our day today experience. Who's this man on the screen? Gandhi. Okay. Now, in the 1930s, there's a, apparently a story of this, of this boy who was absolutely obsessed with eating sugar. Okay. He just loved it. He just ate this sugar, like too much sugar, and his mother was really like distressed by this, and she tried everything to try and stop her boy from eating so much sugar. And Eventually, with no success, she thought, I've got an idea. Maybe I'll go to my boy's hero, which was Gandhi. I'm going to go to Gandhi and I'm going to say, Gandhi, can you tell my son to stop eating all this sugar? And maybe he will stop doing it if I do that. And so uh, this, this mother and, and, and her boy, they go on this long um, journey. It had to go many miles by foot to go and reach Gandhi and they get there and and, and the, the mother says, Gandhi, my son just eats too much sugar. Can you please tell him to stop eating so much sugar? And Gandhi said, come back in two weeks' time. And the, woman was very, the mother was very perplexed by this. What do you mean come back? Can't you just tell him to do this thing? So she was confused and she went all the way back home. Two weeks later, she makes the trip all the way back to, to Gandhi and, um, and says, okay, I'm back, Gandhi. And Gandhi looks down at the boy and says, Boy, you eat too much sugar and you should stop. And the boy nodded his head and said, Okay. And the mother was just like, so confused. Gandhi, why did you make me go 
all the way back home and come back again. Why didn't you just say this two weeks ago? And Gandhi said, well, two weeks ago, I was obsessed with eating sugar as well. (laughs) And so he took that two weeks to actually make the change in his life first before he went and he told this, this boy to stop eating sugar. It's one thing to talk about something, but it's another thing altogether to live it out. James has something very similar to say about faith. In James chapter 2, verse 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in, good, in daily food, and one of the, you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? It's quite a hilarious sort of a thing. It sounds good. Oh, may you find the food that you need. And James says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Let's open up our our Bibles. We're going to go to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. And the, as we go through the story of Ezra, the, the big sort of take-home message we're going to get is that faith, I've got on the screen there, faith for it to mean anything at all must go beyond our thoughts, it must go beyond our words, and it must move into the realm of our actions. Okay? Into the realm of our actions. So Ezra, um, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Are you all there? If you're struggling to find Ezra, it's after Chronicles, which is after First and Second Kings. It says, verse 1, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah um, might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says king, Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord. The God of Israel, he is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now this is a remarkable piece of scripture here because this is Cyrus who is talking here. Now Cyrus was Cyrus the Great. Okay, he was the one who led the um, the armies into Babylon on that on that night that um, that Babylon fell. He's the one who would go on to to rule the largest kingdom that had been known in the world up until that point. This is like a serious king who is making this decree. And there's a couple of things, especially in And we find them in verse 2 that really stand out to me about what Cyrus is saying. And the first one is this. I've got the quotation on the board, or you can look at it in your Bible in verse 2. Cyrus says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Now this is Cyrus. This isn't an Israelite king. This isn't a um, a king of Judah. This isn't King David saying this. This is Cyrus. This is a, a pagan king, a foreign king, who is saying, the Lord. Now, if you notice that's in, all in capitals there, that means that the word actually is Yahweh. Okay, um, The Lord. This is the, the, the Israelite um, God has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. What an incredible thing for this foreign king to acknowledge the God of the, of the Hebrews in, in this way. Let's compare it to King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, A number of years earlier, uh, in chapter 4, he was, it says, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of his majesty? Okay, and if you remember this story, after this, uh, he, gets, he goes crazy and he becomes this wild man and he lives like an animal for seven years as a, as a result of this great pride that he had. But what a contrast is Cyrus. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Number two, 
the next thing it says in verse 2 is he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Now when I read this, it makes me wonder, what was the line of communication between God and King Cyrus? What brought him to the place where he believed that God was asking him to rebuild the temple, or bring about the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem? Well, remember Daniel, okay? Last, um, the last sermon we pre- I preached two weeks ago, we talked about Daniel and this very close relationship that he had with King Darius. Okay, he was there just before um, Cyrus on the throne. And I want you to go across to Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to read um, what King Darius felt about the God of Daniel. Okay? So you'd remember, remember Daniel had a very important role in the kingdom. When Darius sat on the throne, he reorganized his empire and he divided the empire amongst 120 satraps. And on top of them, he put three, uh, I guess, presidents on top of those 120 satraps. And Daniel was being distinguished as, as one who was going to be put over the whole of the kingdom, second to Darius. And so there was a very open line of communication between Darius and um, and, and Daniel. And you can imagine they would have talked about all sorts of things. And so it's amazing to see what Darius has to say about the, the God of Daniel. And we find this in chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, verse 19. Now this is when, so the scene is Daniel is in the lion's den. Okay, so they, most people think he's, he's well and truly eaten up by this stage. And Darius comes early, first thing in the morning, races down to the den, and he looks into the den and, he, and he's, he's wanting to see if Daniel is okay. And it says, in verse 29, sorry, verse 19, Then at break of day the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den of Daniel, where, uh, came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The, t- the king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Imagine what sort of impact this would have had upon Darius. Um, And even the fact that he went there to inquire if if Daniel was still alive shows that in some way he believed that Daniel's God was able to deliver him in, in, in some way or shape. And following on from that, in verse 25, King Darius says, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, this is Darius speaking, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. What an incredible thing, again, for a foreign king to be saying about the God of Daniel. And if you read the last verse there, in verse 28, it says, So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay? So what we see is that Daniel not only had a very high position under the rulership of Darius, but also Cyrus. So again, there would have been this very frequent dialogue happening between Daniel and this king. Now, one of the things about Daniel was he was a very educated person, and he was particularly educated in the scriptures, and an area of focus for him was the prophecies that that were foretelling the, um, the restoration of Israelites from exile back to Jerusalem. And we see that when we go to Daniel 9. I'm not going to go there right now. But Daniel has been studying Jeremiah and he sees his prophecy how they'll be in, in exile for 70 years. And he's reading that and he, and he, he starts fasting and praying with God to, that that would, that would um, come about. And so the way I sort of picture it, I sort of have this picture of, of Daniel um, talking with Cyrus and, and saying, Hey, Cyrus! Do you know about the prophecies about my people being restored back to Israel? 
have you heard about these? And Cyrus saying, no, tell me, Daniel. And imagine Daniel giving a Bible study to Cyrus that maybe looks something like this. Isaiah 44 and verse 24, a couple of verses here. Um, this is a prophecy about how God was going to restore the Israelites, but in particular, the role of Cyrus in that whole process. Now notice as we read through this, this was written by Isaiah around about 150 years prior to this um, taking place, so before Cyrus was even born. Thus says the Lord, who says of Jerusalem, She shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. So these are promise the, the exiled Israelites be brought back into Jerusalem. Who says of Cyrus, now this is, this is speaking of this king by name, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. What do you think Cyrus would have thought when he saw his name written there in the scriptures that was written 150 years earlier? It would have been an incredible thing. And probably Daniel would have gone then to the next few verses in Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. Okay, here God is appealing to this king through writings that were written many years earlier. Whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. Now, some of those details connect directly to the way that Cyrus had conquered the the city and the nation, the empire of of Babylon. And you can imagine him just reading that going, but Daniel, when was this written? This is amazing. And so here God is having this appeal to Cyrus by name. And imagine if your name was written in there. Imagine if you just opened up the Bible one day and it said, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Mercy, to Harold, to Stuart, to Rick. And you read your name. You'd be paying a lot of attention to what was going to come next. It goes on to say, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. And imagine Cyrus seeing this and being convicted, wow, and thinking, that's right, when I conquered Babylon, there was a lot of just strange things that happened. It seemed almost miraculous some of the things that happened in, that allowed me to, to get into Babylon. I'm thinking, wow, the God of Daniel must have been helping me in that in conquering on that day. And he reads through and he reads about this, this um, how God is asking him to return the Israelites back to their um, back to their their promised land. And the last bit where it says, um, He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward. Let them go freely. And indeed, this is actually what took place. In Ezra chapter six. This is recounting the, de- the decree that we read in Ezra chapter 1. It says, In the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt and let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Not only would he send them home, but he was the one who was going to pay for this temple to be rebuilt. Now, there's a couple of le- um, lessons that we learn from the first part of Cyrus, we're going to get into Ezra in a moment. The first one is that no one is beyond the reach of God. If you were to think of who Daniel, or who the Israelites would impact as exiles in this foreign kingdom, you wouldn't think Cyrus would be that person. You wouldn't think Nebuchadnezzar would be that person. You wouldn't think Darius would be that person. But again and again we see God reaching the hearts of people that we would have thought were far beyond the reach of ever um, submitting to and learning about and putting their belief in the God of the Israelites. No one is beyond the reach of God. Not your children, not your neighbors, not your family, other family members, not your friends, not the the person that sells you um, petrol at the service station. No one is beyond the reach 
of God. The second thing we learn from this is that God is able to provide. What an incredible example of God's providence. Every resource the Israelites needed was given to them. Every person that was needed was able to go back to Jerusalem. Every freedom, every law, everything, every piece of bureaucracy that had to be passed through, um, God provided everything that was needed for the Israelites to go back to the promised land. And I want you to turn to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, right in the middle of the Bible. Now this is the another one of the prophecies that Daniel was very familiar with, um, talking about how 70 years they would be in Babylon and they would be restored. Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 10. It says, For thus says the Lord, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So here is a a promise that God is going to provide for the Israelites in exile, and what we've seen with the story of of Cyrus is God actually fulfilling that promise. But something that stands out to me in this is that even though God promises it, we still are to seek it. Okay? In verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So God promises, and God promises to us. The promise is for us. God has a plan for us. He has a future for us. He has all these things he wants to do in the Forest's Beach Church, but we need to actually pray to God and to seek his face um, for him to bring it about. Now, tomorrow night, you would know that we have a special prayer meeting for our church building. And the reason for this is not because we have terrible news for you. Okay, that's not why we're having this. Uh, We actually have some good news about some new developments that have happened. But we don't want to just presume on God's um, providence and and guiding and and providing for us into the future. We want to actually seek God, just as God asked Daniel to do and the Israelites to do. We want to, uh, we believe that God is able to provide for us everything that we need to get this new building built and to make a really big impact upon the Central Coast community here. But we're going to, in fulfilling this this uh, requirement here, we're going to seek God. We're going to seek Him with all of our heart. And so I encourage you to come along to the church at 6 tomorrow afternoon and we're going to spend some time for that. Um, let's continue on. Now, where are we at? So what happens as a result of this decree is is nothing short of a... It's basically a second exodus that takes place. Um, there's 50,000 people that go up from, from, um, from Babylon. 10,000 animals have all this incredible wealth that they take with them. They're on their way to back to the promised land. And when they get there, they rebuild the altar. Sacrifices are re-established. Um, the foundation is built. And eventually the temple is built. And God has, um, is fulfilling his promises. But the thing that they haven't yet built is the, is the city. Okay, The walls still lie in ruins, and God still has a much bigger work to achieve back there in Israel. And this is where the character called Ezra comes into the story. So Ezra chapter 7 is where I want you to turn to. Lost the place of it here. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. Okay. Starting in verse 1. First question we're going to look at is who was Ezra? Ezra chapter 7, verse 1 says, Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, now there's a few tricky names in this, but I'll do my best at pronouncing them, Ezra the son of 
Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalem, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Meraoth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. Now the reason that it had lists all of those names is that Ezra was firstly a descendant of Aaron, and it traces that back. And that means that he was a priest. Okay, and not only was Ezra a priest, but Ezra was also a scribe. And you might you hear about the scribes in the New Testament with Jesus, and Ezra was sort of the first that we hear of these people in this position of scribe. He was a man very educated in the scriptures, and it says in verse six, uh, this Ezra went up from Babylonia, he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted to him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So he's skilled in the law of Moses, he was passionate about the word of God, and he was passionate about teaching the word of God. And the thing that was incredible about Ezra was the way in which God trusts, I mean, and the way in which King Cyrus trusted him. It says, For the hand of the Lord his God was on him with everything that he did. It reminds me of Joseph back in, in Egypt. Um, whatever he did, God blessed it. The hand of the Lord was on everything that Joseph did. It reminds me of um, Daniel, who had this excellent spirit within him. Everything he did, God blessed it. And the same was true with Ezra. Now, Ezra, uh, King Artaxerxes, who was a king at this time, gives a decree to Ezra that was sort of similar to the decree that was given, that Cyrus gave a number of years earlier. Now, we're not going to read through the decree because it's quite long, but I've listed on the screen the elements of this decree. Okay? Ezra chapter 7, the decree of Artaxerxes. These are the things that he empowered Ezra with. Number one, Ezra is to go to Jerusalem to see how things are going there. Number two, any Israelite is allowed to go with him. Number three, He is to take lots of gold and silver with him. Number four, this money is for the temple resources. Number five, he can do whatever he wants with the rest. Now for those who are are familiar with Bible prophecy, one of the reasons that we, we, in Daniel 9, we go back to this decree is because it was this, that he was allowed to do whatever he wanted with the rest of the money that gave him permission to rebuild the city, which fulfilled the requirements of Daniel Nine, if you're familiar with that chapter. Keep going on. If he needs more money, he can get it from the king's treasury. Um, he can appoint judges and magistrates, and if anyone doesn't obey the law of his God, they can be killed, banished, or have their goods confiscated. Okay. Now, this is a pretty incredible thing for King Artaxerxes to give to Ezra. Okay. He gives him this letter, and there's this big group of um, Israelites that go back, well, it's actually much smaller than the first one, they go back to, to Israel, Incredible thing, the incredible favor that God gave these the Israelites under the, the kings of Persia. Um, so, this is the scene. Ezra has... Okay, Ezra is, is gathering people to go, make this second wave of, of people that's going to go back to the promised land. And he, he gets... Um, he says, then I set... Tw- apart twelve of the leading priests, um, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their kingsmen with them, and I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offering for the house of the God and the king and his counselors and his lords, and all Israel there present had offered. So basically, imagine Ezra is sort of preparing himself for this big journey. And he has a whole bunch of gold and silver, and he finds these twelve priests, and he divides this silver and gold amongst them. Now this is the thing I really want you to pay attention to is how much gold and silver he was given. I weighed out into the hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth 1,000 darics and two vessels of fine bright bronze as precious as gold. Now that might mean nothing to you, all those numbers, but let me explain it. This is what King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra. Firstly, 100 plus talents of gold. Now, a talent is around about 34 kilograms, okay? So, you multiply that by 100, and you have about three and a half tons of gold. Now, if you, work the, if you look at the price of gold today, now, I don't know what the price of gold was back then, but you multiply that by 
that much gold, this is equivalent of $175 million of gold was given to Ezra. Now, the silver that he was given, 850 talents, which works out to be almost 30 tons of gold, I mean of silver. This is like huge amounts of money that were given. Now, a couple of years ago, I had to get, I think it was about $1,500 out from the bank. And I went down to the ATM and I put my card in and I withdrew $1,500 and I had it in a little envelope there. And I'll tell you, have you ever walked around with a large amount of money? How do you feel when you're doing that? Do you feel a bit like people are watching you? A bit nervous? Depends how much money it is and probably some of you have carried much more money around than that. Can you imagine if you're about to go on a journey and you had to carry equivalent of around about, it's about $200 million worth of precious metals that weighs about 35 tons. So remember, this was divided amongst the 12, 12 of the leading priests, and they're like, got this, this is like, what is it, like $10 million each? $20 million each almost that they're carrying around. Now, the other thing that's really incredible, incredible about this journey was that it was all the way from um, all the way from Babylon to Israel. Now, if you look at a map, that's actually quite a long way. In fact, it's around about 1,500 kilometers. And if you read through the story, it took them four months to make this journey. Now, if you have... A, it was actually not a very big, not a huge group of people that went back with Ezra. You have this group of, of people carrying 35 tons of gold and silver for 1,500 kilometers, do you think you'd feel a bit nervous about that? This is a pretty scary task they were given. Now, all of this, I want you to, it's all really bringing us to this, um, this point here. We've been talking about taking your faith, not just having it in words and thoughts, but taking it into the realm of actions. And I want you to see what Ezra says when he's about to go on this journey. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came... To, oh, sorry, that's four months um, that it took him. Here we go. So they gathered at this river. I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava. And there we camped three days as I reviewed the people. So he's, he's doing the last checks for his journey. And says, so then I proclaimed a fast there and the, at the river Ahava and we, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and our goods. So here he's praying and he's pleading to God for a safe journey, and this is the reason why they were pleading with such earnestness. In verse 22, For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of, of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, The hand of our God is for good on all those who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. Um, so he fasted and implored our God and he listened. So basically Ezra had been talking with the king and he's been telling the king of how God is able to provide and God has this great power and God is able to do these amazing things. And then he's about to go on this journey and he thinks, man, I've been talking about all these things to the king. I can't now go and ask him for a whole bunch of soldiers to protect us along the way. Even though the journey was 1,500 kilometers, even though they had $200 million worth of, of, um, of, of material to, build, to take with them, and there was all these bands of, of, of I don't know, bandits, I don't know what would have been along the way, that could have raided them along the path. He says, I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers because we had professed, professed that we have faith in God. And as I said before, it's one thing to talk about something it's another thing altogether to live it out. Words come pretty easy. You might have heard the song, All Things Are Possible. Have you ever sang that song? All things are possible. Da -da -da -da. All things are possible. It's very easy to sing that song. Is it a bit harder to live it out? When you're in a difficult situation, you don't know what the future holds. All things are possible. It's another thing to live it out. Faith for it to mean anything at all must go beyond our thoughts. It must go beyond our words and move into the realm 
of our actions. Now, this is a story I told you earlier on. You might remember this guy. And since we're doing a bit of a review, I thought I could share this story again. But this story conveys the point of this message more than any other story that I know of. So I'm going to share it again. Charles Blondin, we'll do a, the shortened version, 1859, walked a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Okay? Crowds came out to see him, and they were, they were amazed about if he would survive, what would happen, would he make it all the way across this tightrope. And the, it was 11,000 feet off the ground. First, He did it first, and he, he did it with the pole. Too easy. He did it without the pole. Too easy. And then he started stepping it up. He went across blindfolded, across Niagara Falls. He went across in a sack. Got himself in a sack. I don't know how he would have moved along there. Gets across there and um, survives. He does it on stilts. I don't know how that would have would have taken place, but but he, he that's how it's recorded. He did it on on stilts. And then as one of the sort of the the climax of these great feats, feats he he went halfway along. He stopped in the middle. He cooked up an omelet. And he ate the omelette in the middle of the tightrope. Now, everyone's watching on this just cheering and being amazed. Wow, you're the greatest tightrope walker in the whole world. And so then he gets his wheelbarrow. And he gets his wheelbarrow and he goes across the, the, the rope all the way across this huge um, expanse, gets the other side, comes back, and they're amazed. Wow, you're so amazing. Then he puts a sack of potatoes in it. He does it again. Brings it back. You're so amazing. And he says, do you think I can put a person in this? And I said, oh, we believe you can put a person in, in that wheelbarrow. You're the greatest tightrope walker in the whole world. He says, who wants to hop in? <laughs> who wants to hop in? Silence upon the whole crowd. Friends, faith needs to go beyond simply words. It needs to go into the realm of our actions. We need to get into the wheelbarrow. The heroes of the Old Testament were not heroes because they had some sort of intellect that was far superior to ours. They were not heroes of faith because of some great strength that they had or some incredible wisdom, although they did have some of these things. The reason they were such heroes was because they actually got into the wheelbarrow. Think about Abraham. There, trembling with his hand, needing to kill, um, sacrifice his son Isaac. Not sure how God will bring about a nation through Isaac, but he believes that God can even raise him from the dead. And he goes to do it. He hops into the wheelbarrow and, and God catches him right at the last second. Think about Joshua, marching his, the Israelites around Jericho. What an incredible thing. He got into the wheelbarrow. Think about King David, who was there um, in, in, in hiding in a cave and just... Um, every reason to be absolutely terrified and just to give up. He trusted in God and said, no, I'm going to put my strength in Jesus because that's in, in God because that's the only place that we can get it. And think about Ezra. He's there with all this gold, this t incredible journey ahead of him, and he says, you know what? I've professed this faith. I'm going to put it into the action now. We need to get into the wheelbarrow. Now, in front of your chairs... There's a little card that looks like this. You might not have noticed it. You might have noticed it. There should be enough for everyone. If you're up the back row, you'll see the, the cards behind the seat. If anyone doesn't have one, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. So grab the cards, pass them around. There's some pens in the, behind the seats as well. This is a little response card, and it's a way that we're, today we're going to give you the opportunity to put, I guess, get into the wheelbarrow, to, to put your faith, not to have it just something that is professed or that you believe with your mind, but that you, you actually live out with your day today. So get your, your response card. Does anyone not have a response card? There should be plenty to, to go around there. My wife's got some extras if you don't have one. So, yeah, you've got name, phone, email there. Put down what you feel comfortable um, putting on there. The first decision is this. It is my desire to live by faith, not only with my words, but also in everything that I do. Okay, if that's your desire, let's 
straight from our message today, if you want to be like these heroes of faith, like Ezra, you want your faith to go into the realm of your actions, tick that box. Box number two. I have felt God leading me to do something, yet have been resistant. Today I make a decision to trust and follow God in this. Now this is a personal one. The, the box doesn't, doesn't share, ticking the box doesn't tell anyone what this thing is, but maybe there's someone here today who's had God speaking to you, convicting you about something, and you've thought, that's too scary, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'll put that off into the future. Um, for whatever reason, you've been resistant to God leading you in some aspect of your life. But today you want to say, today I make a decision to trust and follow God in this aspect of my life. Whatever that is for you, if there's something you can think about that you want to make a decision to follow God with, I encourage you to tick that box. Box number three. Today I make a decision to be a follower of Jesus. There might be someone here who's never made that decision in their life to commit their life to Jesus and to follow him. It's a scary thing. Following Jesus, you don't know necessarily what the future is going to hold, but you know the one who holds the future. And so if you want to make a decision today to be a follower of Jesus, tick that box there. The next one. Now these are a few of the uh, practical ways. Um, I can't imagine anyone would tick all of these boxes. Um, but these are a few practical ways that you can metaphorically get into the wheelbarrow. Um, I would like to have Bible studies to find out more. There might be someone here who has some Bible questions, would like to have a deeper, a one-on-one -on -one sort of a look through the Bible with someone, like myself. If you would like to do Bible studies, tick that box. Maybe you would like to get baptized. Some people, you might have lived 20 years and you've just thought, I've never actually thought about getting baptized. Maybe today is your day. If you would like to get baptized, tick that box. The next one, I would like to lead a small group. Okay, we're soon to, um, we're going to be launching fairly soon, probably the beginning of next year, um, a small group. Um, we already have a number of small groups here at our church, but an expanded small group ministry. And if you would like to lead a small group on anything from cycling through, studying through Revelation, and you'd like to talk to me about that, tick that box. The next one, I would like to do the Arise course. Now, the Arise course is a four-month immersive Bible training and outreach experience. I did the Arise course back when I finished high school, and I talked to one person this morning who has just signed up to do the Arise course. And um, you can actually do it online now. You don't have to quit your job to do it. You can actually do it all online. If you're thinking, maybe that's me, um, I'm going to give that a shot. Tick that box. And finally, I'm going to join tomorrow's prayer meeting. That's one that I'm sure many of you are able to tick. Comments and prayer at the end. Um, by faith, the heroes of the Old Testament conquered all sorts of incredible things. But they were not um, doing this because there was anything remarkable about them different to us, but because they put their, their trust completely in God. Let's have our final song and then we'll finish with prayer. After the final prayer, I'll be um, shaking hands up the back and I've got the box here, which is the, the um, box for the cards. So as you walk out, just drop your box in your card in the box. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the stories that we've explored over the last seven or eight months. And Father, I've been inspired by these stories. Um, and together they've all sung the song, Lord, faith is the victory. And Lord, there's, we, we thank you for the decisions that people have made this morning and um, whatever they are, Lord, you know what, what people have decided in their hearts and their minds and we pray that, that you'll give them the courage to follow through with those things, um, Lord. And I pray that, um, that you would just bless us as we go into our week. Lord, help us to get into the wheelbarrow. Lord, help us to not live a, a Christian experience that's just about words and just about what takes place uh, in our minds, Lord, but maybe something that makes a radical difference to each and every day of our lives is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.